Well, I mentioned that monster rally for stocks so far this year. David Rosenberg's here to give us his take on where we go, both in the markets and the economy. He's the chief economist and strategist at Gleskin Chef and Associates. Nice to see you. Great to be in studio. I, uh, I look at these numbers sometimes. I just said it there, 24% for the S&P since Christmas Eve. Um, who knew back then? Um, what do you make of the rally that we've seen, both in Canada and the U.S., for stocks? Uh, well, it hasn't just been Canada and the United States. I mean, it's been uh, a huge global rally. Uh, and it's really hinged on, to a large extent, on the Federal Reserve and not just the Fed doing this famed pivot that everybody knows about. Because um, back in December, when the trap door opened up, uh, the view was that Jay Powell was tone deaf. Uh, and now not only are they not going to raise rates, they may cut rates. We already know that the balance sheet uh, runoff is going to end in September. But you've had a more dovish tilt, you know, with the Bank of Canada, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia, New Zealand. And on top of that, you know, starting, you know, last fall, when you really think about it, China's uh, stimulus starts to really kick into gear, monetary and fiscal stimulus. Uh, and so that's what, you know, when you think about China, it was actually the market that led everything lower towards the end of last year. Their market was peaking and rolling over long before, and they were about the first market to turn around. So I think you had the uh, situation at the Fed spill over to other central banks, much more dovish, interest rates uh, no longer the big risk that they were, uh, Chinese stimulus coming to the fore. And I think in the Canadian context, you brought that up, what made this very special yeah. was you look at the, when you look at the Canadian dollar price of oil, uh, it's up almost 80% uh, year to date. And that's a tide for Canada that lifts all the boats because when you look at the overall TSX, it has an 80% correlation uh, to the price of oil. So that's been a real game changer here as well. And then in trying to figure out where we go from here, I mean, I, let's, let's start with the U.S. because it, it has... You know, you hear people saying things like reluctant investors, and we're kind of like right back near those September highs, and we're moving higher, but some people wonder, why are we moving higher right now? Um, what do you think are the driving forces from here on out? Well, I think that, that the Fed fully priced in now. When I say fully priced in, I mean, now the markets realize the Fed is on hold uh, for at least the next 6 to 12 months. So it's no longer about central banks. Uh, it's going to be about the economy and about earnings. Uh, I think right now, when you're taking a look at sentiment levels, uh, the investor surveys, uh, you're taking a look at valuations, um, they're back to where they were before the market started to have some trouble last September. And like we look at last year's fourth quarter, and all we think about was the cataclysmic decline in the last week uh, leading up into the lows on Christmas Eve. People tend to forget that the market started to wobble. Uh, towards the end of September. So October, it started to go down. November was going down. December, of course, it was cataclysmic. But the market was having trouble for a few months before the uh, big December decline. Well, we're back to the valuation metrics we had. We have back to the sentiment, uh, the level of volumes. Uh, so I think right now the upside uh, is really limited. Uh, and I would say that there's probably more downside than upside from here. I look at the Canadian market. I mean, the Canadian market right now trailing PE multiples at 20 back to where we were before the September decline. Uh, on a forward basis, uh, we're still around 15. This market is more than fully priced. So I, and I think that you can pick stocks, you can pick sectors, but if you're buying ETFs that are being benchmarked on the overall indices, we're more than fully priced right now. What about this issue of sentiment, though, around the energy sector? It's, it's a less tangible way of measuring things than economists sometimes like to. But it does feel like there is some momentum behind the Canadian energy sector that wasn't there right. last year. Well, look, I think that, um, you know, for one thing, you take a look at the Canadian E&Ps, and, and they're priced for, let's look at WTI right now. Uh, they're priced for WTI somewhere around $52, $53. Uh, we're already in the mid-60s. Um, so, you know, insofar as uh, we can sustain oil prices above $60, you could find more of a re-rating on the energy space. That might be one area I think that could have uh, some limited upside potential against the overall market. And of course, uh, you know, the election in Alberta, uh, you know, although it was largely priced in, uh, is, a, is a game changer as well from a policy perspective and maybe a leading indicator for change in Ottawa in October. But I would say that uh, if there was one element of the Canadian market that is looking still pr looking good right now with upside without having to have any incremental positive news for it would be the energy space. Okay. Now, the, I mean, your view, we talk about David Rosenberg, always cautious, can be bearish. Um, and coming into this year, you were already building a narrative around this transition from the long-term bull market. So um, 
I guess for those people who are wondering, like, what do you do with your investments if, to your point, we're not going to see any more moves on interest rates for a while? It's hard to find places to park your cash. There has been this momentum for the stock market. And, you know, as, as, as while well, this bull market, maybe it is coming to an end, it's been a pretty long one and a, a yeah. rewarding one for a lot of investors. So what do you do? Yeah, well, you know, look what happened. We, we hit that first peak in the S&P 100, uh, January of 2018. Uh, we burst through that. It was right after, by the way, Jeremy Grantham was talking about a melt-up. Uh, that was the kiss of death. And then we have a pretty big correction, you know, into the spring. And then we have a rally back up to the highs in September. So we had a double peak. Then we have the fourth quarter um, drawdown. And now we're back challenging the highs. Uh, so we have a lot of volatility. And remember, volatility actually goes in both directions, up and down. Uh, but when you look at the chart, if you're a technical analyst, you will see very clearly a classic head and shoulders pattern emerging of late in this rally back up towards the highs. It's been the right part of that shoulder. I'm, not, I'm an economist talking like a technical analyst. <laughs> but, but when, when you take- Larry Berman. No, but well, if you, uh, and I see him right over there, yeah. but um, he's giving me the hand signals. But when, you, when you're taking a look at the overall picture, it still looks quite a bit different, the contours of this bull market uh, than it did uh, in the previous, say, you know, seven, eight years. The last couple of years have been a jagged edge uh, and we're still, I think, um, testing, retesting the highs. Like at the end of a bear, uh, at the end of a bull market, you test and retest the lows. I still think we're in a topping formation. I still think we're making a transition from a fundamental bull market to a fundamental bear market. It doesn't happen in a day. Sometimes it could take years for this to fully complete itself. And in the interim, uh, you want to focus on special situations. Um, you know, you can focus on energy. If your view is that the oil price is going to stay, uh, say, W in the mid-60s, there is upside potential in energy, maybe some ancillary sectors. Financials obviously have a very high correlation today with the price of oil. You can build some sort of strategy around energy. Um, you know, if you're taking a look, for example, in my opinion, if we have a view that the Fed is done, Bank Canada is done, that interest rates are going to stay low, well, that puts income equity, that puts the dividend players in the stock market uh, as something that has an appealing attribute. In fact, when you're taking a look at the dividend aristocrat index, classic dividend growth, dividend yield, uh, they've outperformed the overall index this mm. year. Uh, so I think you can invest around low interest rates in the stock market too, and that's a focus on low payout ratios, dividend growth, dividend yield. It's not a sector by sector. I mean, you could look at utilities, but they're very expensive. But there's other areas of the market. Right now, seven of the TSX sectors today pay you a dividend yield better than you'll get in the Government of Canada uh, bond market. That's something that's pretty new. We didn't have that 10, 20 years ago. So I'd say if you're in the equity market, you got to be fully invested. Focus on the income generating characteristics in an ongoing low interest rate environment. And before you go, since you mentioned financials, and, and you don't cover individual bank stocks per se, but there has been this growing chorus of concern from some investors and analysts about credit in Canada yeah. and the exposure that banks have to it. Do they have to... Uh, set aside some provisions for that. And even today, just um, household debt was back in focus because MNP had this latest survey and they're saying 48% of Canadians are 200 bucks or less away from insolvency. How big a concern is this issue to you for everything, for the stock market, for the Canadian economy, for people being able to pay their bills in Canada? Right. Well, the one thing we have to keep in mind about the TSX is that it's, it's not a market that is determined by Canadian GDP as much as global GDP. We're really a torque on the global economy. Uh, what happens in China actually has a bigger bearing on our stock market than what happens in Canada. Um, so have to keep that in mind. Um, you know, in terms of the banks, yes, I fully would st uh, agree with you uh, that the level of household debt uh, is a big impediment to Canadian growth. Uh, it could be a problem. I think it will be a problem or a constraint on Canadian bank earnings. Is, is it a question of impairing bank capital? No, I don't see that at all. But I would say that, you know, we do have still a debt bubble of historical proportions in this country. I mean, the household debt to disposable income ratio in Canada is 180%. At the bubble peak, when I was pounding my fist on the table when I was at Mother Merrill back in 2007, at the peak of their bubble, it was 150%. Yeah. And you take a look at around the world, people talk about a Chinese debt bubble. Their household debt ratio is 110%. In Italy, it's barely 100%. We're the, so, so I would say 100% right. And right, right now, for the first time in, since 2007, Canadians are spending 15 cents out of every after-tax dollar servicing their debt. 
even with low interest rates because they have to pay back the principal on this gargantuan amount of liabilities. So I'd say, you know, is it a banking sector problem per se? I'd say here's a bigger problem for me. Insofar as Canadians meet their debt servicing requirements, it's going to be a big problem for retail sales and the Canadian consumer, which is 60% of the economy. And that's why I'm ongoingly, even with the price of oil doing better, I'm ongoingly bearish on the Canadian dollar in that environment. All right. So much to chew on here. David Oates, good to get your perspective. Thanks a lot. Thank you. David Rosenberg, Chief Economist at Gleskin Chef and Associates, joining us.